Uh, our next uh, speaker is uh, Lyndon Roberts, and he's going to give us a talk. Uh, Lyndon's from the a ANU and is, of course, well known to us and been quite involved in uh, things in Australia quite of recent times. And Lyndon's going to give us a talk on derivative free optimization with convex constraints. So uh, thanks, Lyndon. OK, great. You can hear me OK? Yep. OK. Um, so yeah, uh, thanks, Andrew, and thanks to all the organizers uh, for an interesting week. Um, yes, yeah, so this is uh, hopefully uh, some of you may have seen this last week at OSTMS, so I apologize if uh, you get a bit too bored, but hopefully there's something that you see again that is of more interesting the second time around. Uh, yes, yeah, so this is joint work with Matthew Hoff, who was an undergrad at UQ and he's um, worked with me over a summer project, but he's now just moved to Waterloo in Canada to start a PhD. Um, so my plan is to uh, give a fairly brief rundown of uh, unconstrained derivative free optimization first, because that's where most of the existing results uh, live. And I'll sort of talk through what, what, what kind of uh, theoretical sort of guarantees we need in that sort of setting and why it's generally been considered a problem that we can't really uh, have much solid theory in a constrained situation. And then I'll spend the bulk of the time talking about how we're able to get around that uh, and look at the case of uh, simple convex constraints. Uh, in particular, how we develop an algorithm and how we look at uh, geometry for the purposes of uh, functional interpolation. And hopefully if I get a bit of time, I'll talk about uh, some applications to constrained least squares problems. So the context I'm looking at here is uh, nonlinear non-convex optimization uh, and I'm going to start off by it just being unconstrained over Rn. So I've got this objective function f, and I'm not really going to assume anything about it. Uh, it's going to be nonlinear, non-convex, differentiable, uh, but I'm not really going to have much structure around it. So if we're going to optimize this classically, Newton's method, quasi-Newton methods, and so on, we would uh, typically maybe locally approximate f with quadratic models. So maybe we'd build a Taylor series around our current iterate. But of course, in order to do that, we need to be able to calculate at a minimum the gradient of f, uh, maybe the Hessian or whatever else we might want. Uh, in practice, how would we do that? We would, if we knew the analytic form of f, we could write code by hand um, coming from or you know, symbolic calculation of the gradients. Uh, if we didn't, we could do finite differencing. Uh, or if we were clever enough, maybe we could use back propagation or algorithmic differentiation uh, to calculate derivatives if we had kind of uh, good access to the source code of the uh, evaluation of f. But there are plenty of settings where none of these options are available. Uh, particularly if your function is black box, then you certainly can't uh, write down your analytic derivatives and you can't use algorithmic differentiation tools and you're sort of left with finite differencing. But if you've got a function that's uh, got a lot of computational noise uh, or is very expensive to evaluate, then finite differencing isn't really practical uh, or may just give you not very good results. So in, this is a sort of situation where we might turn to derivative free optimization or zeroth order optimization uh, for those uh, in, sort of in, in the machine learning context is what it gets called there. And there are plenty of situations where these kind of properties of this objective function arise. Um, this is a, there's a whole wide class of methods, so I'm not going to talk about all of them. I'm going to focus on uh, what's called model-based DFO, and that's really trying to uh, borrow the sorts of techniques that work very well in sort of the unconstrained local optimization case uh, and adapt them to this derivative free setting. So as I said, in a traditional you know, Newton quasi Newton type environment, we might uh, approximate our objective F uh, around XK by a model uh, that is going to be, for instance, given by a quadratic Taylor series like this. Uh, obviously the stuff in red, the gradient in the Hessian, we don't have access to in this derivative free environment. So what we're going to do is just replace the gradient with some vector, the Hessian with some matrix. And we're just going to keep this approximation and just try and find some way to get a reasonable choice of G and H that doesn't use any derivative information around F. And the way we're going to do this uh, is using interpolation. So we're going to sample values of F, sort of broadly speaking in a neighborhood of XK and use that to find, to fit a quadratic function to that. And I'll go into more detail uh, in theory in a second, but the basic idea is that if your points are well spaced, uh, have good geometric properties, so for instance, they don't all lie in a subspace, uh, then you can prove that the corresponding interpolation model that you get is as good as the Taylor series, uh, up to constants, 
And if you've got an approximation that's just as good as the Taylor series, then if you put that into a reasonable algorithm, you should get pretty much the same convergence results as you would get in a derivative-based setting. And the particular sort of general setting we're going to use are trust region methods. Uh, they, they tend to be sort of the most popular uh, in this area. And so broadly speaking, what we're going to do is we're going to build our interpolation model, uh, MK, uh, as I said, by sampling F uh, and fitting a quadratic function. We're then going to solve this trust region subproblem that says let's minimize our approximation in some neighborhood of our current iterate where this neighborhood has radius delta k, which we'll update as the algorithm progresses. Um, so this is a structured subproblem, and there are efficient methods to solve this, even though this is a non-convex problem, you can actually solve this to global optimality uh, reasonably efficiently. Given this calculated step, we're then going to basically evaluate f at the tentative new point that it suggests, which is essentially xk plus sk, and we're either going to accept that step and we'll move our new iterate to that point if we sufficiently decrease the function. If we didn't, we're going to stay put and next time we're going to decrease our radius delta k, working under the idea that a Taylor series approximation gets better the smaller the radius that you're considering it over. In the derivative free setting, we need to do a little bit more. Uh, at the end, so these last two steps are sort of uh, don't appear in the classical situation. Uh, but once we've got a new piece of information, we're going to incorporate that into our interpolation set. And if need be, make sure our interpolation set is good in the sense that provides accurate models. And again, I'll talk about that now. So what I haven't said through all this is, yeah, what is a good interpolation set or a good interpolation model? And what sort of uh, convergence type guarantees do we have on the resulting algorithm? So first up, uh, what is a good interpolating model? is the first question I'm going to answer. And basically what we're asking is, uh, we're going to introduce a notion of what's called fully linear, which basically means as accurate as a linear Taylor series up to constants. And specifically what we're going to ask is that the difference between our model and our true function that we're trying to approximate is bounded by a multiple of the trust region radius squared over all perturbations inside that trust region radius. Uh, and a condition that says that the gradient of our function and the gradient of our model agree again, proportional to the trust region radius. So a linear Taylor series satisfies this, where kappa goes like the Lipschitz constant of rad f. Uh, but you can prove that uh, interpolation models can also satisfy this condition, just with a different choice of kappa. And so how do we construct interpolation models that satisfy this condition? Uh, what we do is uh, we introduce a notion of what a good interpolation set is. And the notion is called lambda poised. Lambda here is going to be some positive number that's generally kind of bigger than one. Large lambda means less good uh, interpolation. So small lambda is better. So what we're going to do is we're going to calculate, we're going to sample our function in a bunch of locations uh, near to our current iterate. And we're going to build the associated set of Lagrange polynomials. So remember, uh, there's one Lagrange polynomial per interpolation point, and it's the one that has a value of one at the particular point that it cares about and zero at the remainder of the interpolation points. So we build those Lagrange polynomials and we maximize all of them over the entire trust region uh, area. And we look at the absolute values and we want all the Lagrange polynomials to have small magnitude inside the trust region. And the smaller the magnitude, the better our approximation is going to be. You can think this can be related to, for instance, the condition number uh, of the interpolation problem. But the key result we have is that if you have an interpolation set that satisfies this lambda poisonous condition, and it's not too far away from your current iterate, then if you build an interpolation model, uh, it's going to uh, meet this fully linear condition, and this constant kappa is going to be proportional uh, to this lambda value that comes in your poisonous definition. And I've hidden some uh, dependencies on the dimension and uh, objective function and so on as well uh, inside this big O. So that's the basic idea. If you can get uh, nice interpolation points by this measure, then you can get a model that's as good as the Taylor series up to constants. And so we can end up getting some convergence and worst case complexity bounds. Uh, the sorts of things we might be proving are if we've got a function with Lipschitz continuous gradient that's bounded below, then the sequence of gradients we produce converge to zero. 
uh, and we can pr prove the specific rate that says the gradient is driven below epsilon after epsilon to the minus two iterations. And again, I've hidden some dependencies on kappa uh, and f in here as well. But these are the sorts of results we might get. And these, uh, you can pretty much prove exactly the same theorem in the classical derivative base case as well. So that's kind of the sort of lightning introduction to the uh, unconstrained setting. So now let's look at introducing constraints into this and see what happens. So the setting I'm going to use here is I'm going to, again, minimize f of x, but I'm now going to add uh, the constraint that x lies in c. And c is going to be some closed convex set, and I'm going to need that to have non-empty interior as well. And what I'm going to be asking for here is that the algorithm I produce is going to be strictly feasible. So I never want to evaluate f uh, outside of c. And I'm going to assume that my access to c uh, comes from a uh, projection operator, so a Euclidean projection. And I'm going to assume that that's cheap so I can do as many projections uh, as I need. So this is going to capture a reasonable variety of constraints, uh, in particular box constraints, half planes, balls, and so on, uh, as well as generalizing the unconstrained case. So this is kind of the framework uh, I'm going to be working in here. And there's a little bit of work that's been done in this setting. So Basically, in this case of unrelaxable constraints, so where your algorithm has to be strictly feasible, uh, people have looked at some simple examples, so bounds, linear inequalities, but really that's only been around algorithm development. People haven't been able to prove anything rigorous about that. Um, closest to what we're doing is there was some work uh, about eight years ago now that looked at exactly our setting convex constraints with projections in a derivative free setting. Uh, where they were able to prove convergence, but not rates around that. But they had this quite severe limitation that every time you built uh, a model, it was fully linear. And as we'll see in a second, that's not necessarily that achievable uh, in practice. So it sort of got us partway there, but it really didn't kind of complete the picture. Um, and some of this work is also linked to a complexity analysis, but in the derivative-based setting. But amongst all of this, the key reason that, that really this hasn't been tackled before is uh, summarized in this uh, survey paper from 2019. And what it's saying is that model-based DFO say, is challenging to design in the presence of unrelaxable constraints because enforcing guarantees of model quality can be difficult. So specifically, if you fix the value of kappa that you desire for your fully linear error bounds, essentially, it might be impossible to ever build that if you're only limited to evaluating your function at feasible points. So that's the big, the big issue here. If we want to uh, meet a certain level of uh, model quality, we may be limited and may, we might not be able to do that using only feasible points. So let's have a look at what that is. And the key thing I'm gonna say, this is correct, but we can get around it is the story um, of the talk today. So let's look at this. Um, briefly. So why can't we achieve fully linear models using only feasible points? So to have a look, just consider this simple 2D example uh, where my trust region is the unit ball. My constraint set says that the absolute value of x2 has to be less than or equal to epsilon. And I'm going to sample three interpolation points at the origin and then just moving as much as I can along each axis until I hit the boundary of either my trust region or the feasible region. And let's suppose I was uh, trying to do linear interpolation. So I've got three points. I can do linear interpolation in 2D. And if I were to do all of that, uh, I would get a lambda poisonous constant that grows like one over epsilon. And remember, the error bounds that we have uh, associated with interpolation is directly proportional to lambda. So if epsilon is small, our error bounds are going to grow very rapidly. And uh, I've chosen what I would consider a sensible choice, your base point, and then just moving sort of in orthogonal directions as far as you can, which is sort of considered basically as good as you would reasonably hope for. You can do a little bit better, but you can't improve. You can't get rid of this epsilon to the minus one rate um, using this. However, if we changed our definition of lambda poisonous and said, you know what? Instead of looking at the size of my Lagrange polynomials everywhere inside my trust region in the whole unit disk, 
what if I only looked at the values of those polynomials inside the feasible region intersect with the trust region? So just inside the shaded region. Well, in that case, I would get lambda is only order one, which is looking like a much more sensible outcome. And the benefit of that and why this might be a sensible thing to do is if I'm requiring a strictly feasible method, well, I'm never going to be asking for function values in this other part of the trust region, which is exactly where the value of the Lagrange polynomials got big. So exactly the, the region that was causing this blow up, this epsilon to the minus one, is exactly the region where I actually don't care what's going on. So why can't we kind of mix the two and try and get over this limitation, this kind of fundamental limitation that I spoke about before? And that's what, exactly what we're going to do. So the old definition of lambda poisonous, a good interpolation set, said that our Lagrange polynomials take small values throughout the trust region area. However, as said, if we require uh, only feasible interpolation points, we get large values of lambda. So our new definition is exactly the same, except now we only care about values of Lagrange polynomials in the feasible region and inside the trust region. So we're definitely going to get a smaller value of lambda, and hopefully that means we're going to get a better interpolation error as well. And as I said, we're only caring about what's happening inside the feasible region because we're never going to care about what happens outside within the general algorithm as a whole. So that's the starting point. Let's look at our Lagrange polynomials inside the constraint set. And now we go to our next level up. What, what sort of accuracy do we need for our interpolation model? Well, this was the fully linear condition that I said before. For all points inside our trust region, we satisfied those error bounds. But again, it turns out that we don't really need all of this. If you go into the details of how the algorithm works, uh, this is quite a strong set of conditions and it's stronger than what we need to make this algorithm work. What we can do is replace this fully linear requirement with a weaker notion of full linearity. So in the first case, what we're going to do is say that our function values of our model and our true function are again within order delta squared of each other, but only inside the feasible region in the trust region, not inside the whole trust region. And for the gradients, uh, instead of the norm of the gradients being bounded by something, I actually only care about the inner product of the gradient errors with a set of feasible directions. And note that the norm here is less than one, not less than delta for this, but we're still only looking at feasible points. So this is a weaker set of conditions than what we had before, although it, it falls back to the original conditions in the unconstrained case. But these definitions are now adapted to our convex constraint set. And what this means is that we can prove this result, which is a, a, a direct uh, generalization of the unconstrained result. So we now ask for an interpolation set that's contained inside our trust region and inside our feasible region. And it needs to satisfy our new weaker definition of lambda poisonedness. So this is where we only care about the values of the Lagrange polynomials in the feasible region. So if it meets our new definition of lambda poisonedness, then we can build a linear interpolation model that meets this fully linear condition, this new weaker fully linear condition, and again, the constant, the kappa that appears is proportional to this lambda. Now, the big restriction here is that at the moment, we can only prove this for linear interpolation, which uh, is a fairly big limitation. And that's why we're going to talk about uh, applications to least squares where that becomes a bit more sensible. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. But this is a bit of a limitation right now. OK. So we've got a new definition of, uh, of interpolation set quality. That gives us a new definition of model quality. And now we can jump all the way back to our upper level trust region algorithm. And essentially, our algorithm looks exactly the same as the unconstrained case. The only things that change are what's in blue. So when we calculate a step, we minimize our model inside our trust region, intersect the feasible region, as we might hope. And the only other thing we need to change is if we're going to make sure our interpolation set is good. If our interpolation set is lambda poised at the end, then make sure we do that according to our new definition rather than our old definition. So essentially, uh, we almost have to change nothing uh, at the upper level algorithm stage. Now we can talk about convergence. And the first thing we need to ask ourselves is what are we actually trying to converge to? Uh, and I'm thinking here in a first order 
optimality sense. And there are a couple of different measures of stationarity we could choose. Uh, the one I'm going to use is this one that uh, is somewhat widely used in trust region methods. And so given our objective function f and a particular point x, what we look at is, again, we take the inner product of our gradient with a bunch of feasible directions that we can move in. And we look at the absolute value of the minimum of that. Now, this has the sorts of properties we would expect uh, of a measure of stationarity. So it's non-negative everywhere. It's zero if and only if you're at a KKT point. Uh, and in the unconstrained case, it reduces to the norm of the gradient. So it does the sort of thing you might expect. Uh, other useful properties uh, are that we've got sort of a smoothness property. So this criticality measure is Lipschitz continuous in X if you've got a uh, Lipschitz continuous gradient of the objective function. And the new result that we can add to this, again, it's the sort of desirable property we might hope for. If you've got a model that's good in the sense that it's fully linear, then the difference between your true stationarity measure and your approximate stationarity measure is proportional to your current trust region radius. So again, this is carries over exactly from the unconstrained case. So this is of a fairly desirable property of a reasonable measure of stationarity. And so putting it all together, we can get exactly the same uh, sort of convergence result as we had in the unconstrained case. So under the same smoothness assumptions, our criticality measure goes to zero, and we can get a rate of convergence that goes like epsilon to the minus two. Uh, so sublinear convergence rate that's standard uh, in so the unconstrained and in the derivative based case. Uh, the things I haven't had time to talk about is in order for this to work, we need uh, some procedures that can verify whether or not a model is fully linear. And if a model is not fully linear, find some suitable modifications to this interpolation set to make it fully linear. Uh, but fortunately, uh, in our world where we've defined lambda poisonous in this almost identical way uh, to the sort of unconstrained case, actually pretty much exactly what you do in the unconstrained case works perfectly well here as well. So I'm not going to talk about that, but we can uh, in the questions if you want. So very quickly in the last of couple of minutes, uh, I want to talk about applying this to least squares problems. And so here our objective function has a sum of squares form. And the reason I'm interested in this as sort of a canonical uh, problem type is because in the classical regime, a standard way of solving it through the Gauss-Newton method is to linearize R. Uh, using sort of the true Jacobian. And so in the derivative free setting, we can linearize and use linear interpolation to uh, approximate the vector function R. And hopefully you can see where I'm going here. So if we take a linear model for our function and square it, we get a quadratic model for our true objective. However, we've only had to do in this derivative free setting linear interpolation. As I said, that's the only one at the moment that we can build these suitably accurate models for but we can use linear interpolation to give us quadratic models that meet this fully linear requirement. So we get, uh, essentially we get a good step towards Newton's method by incorporating curvature without having to prove results suitable for quadratic interpolation, which is a fair bit trickier than linear interpolation. Uh, I've implemented this in some state-of-the-art code, which you can download if you want. Um, we've tested on a bunch of uh, prob least squares problems with some fairly simple constraints. Uh, the trick is, tricky bit is that there's no, not really anything to compare it to. There's no solvers that solve this same problem. Uh, the only examples that are out there essentially do general objective functions with various formulations of constraints. Uh, and so when we show some performance profiles, which I'm not going to discuss in general, we outperform them quite substantially because we're able to exploit the problem structure, whereas the others aren't. Uh, but I guess in the interest of time, I'll just leave it there and say that basically what we've been able to do is to take model-based DFO and overcome or essentially circumvent this limitation uh, of dealing with unrelaxable constraints. Uh, we can match the standard convergence results in this setting, but to do that, we've had to develop uh, an entirely new theory of uh, lambda poisonous fully linear models in this constrained environment, but hopefully that enables people to do uh, similar work in future. We've got solvers in the least squares case in terms of where we wanna go next. Uh, I think looking at second order theory, quadratic interpolation and dealing with this stuff uh, is going to be the most kind of interesting way forward. But I will leave it there and say thanks again for having me and I guess uh, take any questions.
yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks, Lyndon. Um, are there any questions? Yes, Yelchin. Oh, no, yeah, Yelchin's clapping, sorry. <laughs> uh, it always looks the same. Yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, Lyndon, the, the, the second order theory, is that a, a glint in the eye or have you made any progress towards that? Uh, that's a glint in the eye. So we only put out this work a couple of weeks ago. Um, right, right. So, yeah, that that is something I've not really started thinking about yet. Um, so there's, okay. again, there's good unconstrained theory, but I'm not sure what's been done uh, for this sort of second order optimality type results. But yeah, that, there'll be a lot a lot needed for that to work, I think. Mm. Okay. Um, are there any other questions, Lyndon? Okay. Well, that, that uh, brings us probably to the time to swap over to the next